Some people think being a writer is a lot of fun, and in a way it is fun because you don't have a boss and you get to see your books in print and you feel like you have perhaps a little bit of immortality. The downside of it is uh, a lot of isolation, a lot of self-doubt, and constant financial grinding problems. Um, being a novelist is bad enough, being a poet is even rougher. Today I want to talk about two of the poets I've known in the six years I've been living here in Lynchburg. One of them is an older man named Anselm Hollow. Um, the, he's got a whole lot of books out. I might just recommend this one of his called Sojourner Microcosms. It's a collection of his work. And uh, he was here, I guess, from 82 to 84. Let me just read one of the poems from this book. It's a very, very touching poem. It's called The Low Bl Black Square. The Low Black Square is a table, once upon a time, its legs were longer, but I sawed them off, I sawed and I sawed, one of them always shorter than the other three, and so it got a little too low in the end. Kind visitors breathed, ah, Japanese. And on the black square, the tile red cylinder is a picture we found in Venice. We were happy there. In a picture we found in Venice, there are flowers, they are flowers, they are just some flowers. What he's saying there is sort of uh, trying to balance your life, and it just keeps, it's, you can never quite get it balanced. The one thing you have, though, that you remember is the time you are happy and the flowers. Now, Anselm Hollow was not a particularly happy guy. Oh, he's still alive. He's still, perhaps he's happier than he used to be. And he wrote another book of poems, very interesting, called Heavy Jars. And, uh, in there, he has something that's sort of a poem with the title, Heavy Jars. Given the heavy jar full of all relevant information, he dropped it on the sidewalk and burst out laughing as the container and its contents shattered and scattered in the raging blizzard. He had been on his way to present it to her, for her to dispose of as she wished, but with a surreptitious expectation that they might go through it together. Now, the absurdity of the undertaking had become blatantly apparent and he vowed to tell the next full moon that he abjured such subterfuge forever. Silence and starkness, these were the perennial conditions of birth and love and death, the so-called great subjects, the ones no one could ever say anything but the dramatically obvious about. At the very end of this book, Heavy Jars, Anselm has a poem uh, dedicated to a Chinese poet, Li Po, and at the very end he said, he was one of those of whom it is said, he took the charge well. What charge? Well, the charge to be a poet, which is a very difficult and thankless task in this universe that we live in. Today I want to talk about a brand new book of poems called Victims of the Latest Dance Craze by Cornelius Eady. Lives right here in Lynchburg, uh, a full-time poet, which, uh, see, a lot of people say they're poets, but to be a full-time poet is something a little different it's a little harder, a little more demanding, and it produces poetry that's consequently a little more exciting. Uh, this book, by the way, is locally available. I know it's on sale at Givens Bookshop and uh, perhaps in some other shops, Victims of the Latest Dance Craze. Uh, let me just read a couple of things from here. The, every poem in here is about dancing, which gives the book kind of a very interesting unity. We can see that for Edie, dancing perhaps stand, well, stands for a variety of things. Stands for uniting with the universe, meshing into the universe. Also stands for the act of creating a poem. Cornelius is, by the way, a very good dancer. I've seen him dance a few times. Here's a, a, a little paragraph from the first poem. This dance you do draws the cop. What do you call it? We call it scalding the air. We call it dying with your shoes on. And he talks about a a very nice poem in here, The Dance, which I'll read all of this. This goes, when the world ends, I will be in a red dress. When the world ends, I will be in a smoky bar on Friday night. When the world ends, I will be a thought cloud. When the world ends, I will be steam in a tea kettle. When the world ends, I will be a sunbeam through a lead window, and I will shake like the semis on the interstate, and I will shake like the tree kissed by lightning, and I will move, the earth will move too, and I will move, the cities will move too, and I will move th with the remains of my last paycheck in my pocket, 
It will be Friday night, and I will be in a red dress, my feet relieved of duty, my body in free fall, loose as a ballerina in zero gravity, equal at last with feathers and dust, as the world faints and tumbles down the stairs, the jukebox is overtaken at last, and the cicadas under the eaves warm up their legs. So what's this poem about? Well, when the world ends, what does that mean? Is, does he really think the world is going to end? Maybe he just means the world is going to end. This, the way he's thinking about the world right now, is going to end. How does it end? He's in a red dress. He's a man. Why is he wearing a red dress? Well, two brain halves. Each of us has a male half and a female half. The female half is perhaps the artistic half. The red dress is the ultimate flash. Where will he be dancing? Not on a Carnegie Hall stage, in a smoky bar on a Friday night. What will he be like? Dust in a steam kettle, steam in a steam kettle, dust clouds, together with the universe. This is a fantastic book. I'd like to read all the poems in here, actually. Uh, I, d I don't think there's time to do them all. Let me just find, well, I think, OK, we're running out of time. So just let me tell you, run out and get Cronias Edes, Victims of the Lannis Dance Craze. Thank you. Thank you for being with me on another episode of Brain